Okay, hello everyone, and um, you might be a little bit surprised that today I'm not in class, but um, I am attending a conference, and so I've asked Martina to help me a little bit to do our class in a virtual fashion, as if this were an online course, but it's okay. Sometimes a little bit different format, I think it should be just fine as well. And so my purpose was to um, I'll talk about the text and discuss with a little bit with Martina. This is also a great way for all of you to really to get to meet Martina a little bit better. Now she's on film, which is great, so you know who she really is. And we both will just talk about the text, the Trubaritz, the Women Troubadours. Um, and I thought we'd just go through some of the historical context, the literary framework, and then look at some, some of these examples. Because I would say, and I hope you all would agree, this is really interesting material. Um, it might be a little bit strange coming from a man saying, this is really interesting material. This is finally where we hear the female voice. You know, we, we talked about the Kamina Burana, and I was sometimes rather hard on these male writers, wasn't I? Sometimes really attacking them for their sexist attitudes and their macho behavior and the ide almost idealization of sexual violence in some cases. And then on, uh, uh, yeah, well, last class time we talked about the troubadours and uh, of course their new attempts to explore the whole theme of love and suddenly having all these men knights writing love poems. It's kind of a strange thing, isn't it? And then we'll turn to the women uh, poets in a minute Martina, let's just talk a little bit. Have you ever written poems? I mean, it's kind of strange, right? Normally people think they, they are the poets, and uh, that's us. Have you ever written poems? Or? Yeah, I, I, I do still write uh -huh. from time to time. You really? You do? Why? I do that too, by the way. Um, yeah, I heard one of yours on oh, Fish yes. Out of Water, I do remember. Yes, um, that's right. Why? To express myself. Mm -hmm in a certain way to express um, experiences, emotions mm -hmm. in a certain right. way. Are they difficult to write? I mean, you want to write a really good poem. And these writers, the troubadours, they wanted to write really good poems. It depends on the topic, though. Yes. It really yes. depends on what you write and if it's, like, if it's only an intuitive emotion yes. that then it just comes and it you comes. just write. And it's different. But then you know also at some point this is good. Or you still labor on this and you know it's not quite right. I, it will, I think it will never be quite no, good. No, but your own you have the feeling at some point. Yeah. So wouldn't you agree that both with the Kamina Baran and as well with the Troubadour poetry, that is labor, this is hard work. This is really an expression of high artistic skills. So I think this is the first major thing. I have talked already about that a bit on Tuesday. But uh, poetry, this is the new call, the new hallmark of these nobles. This is now 12th century. This is the time of the Crusades. That's a new development of courtly culture. And suddenly, for men, it is very, very important to write poetry and to perform music to demonstrate the elegance of their style, their cultural development. So I think we had already a couple of examples, and we, uh, Guillaume Leneuve was a little bit uh, odd character, a little bit mixed, but uh, let's leave that aside. And now turn to the counterpart. So far, always men. And it sounds like as if love is the theme only by men. But of course, that's not true. 50% of the population always have been women. And now we have the troubadour women. We, we call them troubadours. And they're right about the same time. Um, I'm not quite sure, Martina, were you familiar with these poems? Or did you even ever hear of, of women writing poetry? Of women writing poetry, of course. Yeah, in but modern not times. Right. Yeah, but not necessarily right. in the Middle Ages. That's and not why, necessary. Right, and why would you have thought that in the Middle Ages women were not writing? What is a general assumption? Because of um, the public, um, so uh, because of yeah, the public 
voices that more or less only belong to men right. and because mm -hmm. of yeah how the society was so patriarchal so, society yeah. right carrying over even to the secular world the courts women have to be quiet women are the receivers of orders women are quiet but in the world of courtly love all kinds of strange things happened really and this does not necessarily mean what we think about the history of women as we see it from the 21st century is necessarily true or right in terms of what happened in the Middle Ages. It's a very odd situation because in the 19th century we have the beginning of a women's movement. In the 19th century women started fighting for equal rights, voting rights and so forth and so forth and we are the heirs, thank God, of that women's movement. But in the 19th century, women needed to find a scapegoat. They needed to have a rallying point and project it then in a very powerful and successful way. The world in the past must always be negative. The world of our grandmothers are always worse than our world, right? Our poor great-great-grandmothers, they were just kitchen children church, right? Uh, the, the German KKK, right? Kitchen, children, church. Pardon for the allusion here, but we, we play a little bit of fun on that because it's the German words Kirche, Küche, and Kinder. So it's the German KKK, but it's also very negative. That's what we don't want. We don't want women today just to be stuck at home. And I think what we face now is really exciting. For me, it's really exciting as a researcher as a teacher to present you here with new material that suddenly, like a sort of a, a Sputnik, like a comet suddenly showing up, that women could speak up, they did speak up. Um, it took a long time for researchers to find these materials because, think about it, um, think about your own education, Martina, how many of you professors were men so far? Let's leave uh, the University of Arizona aside because we have a little bit different situations, but back home. Okay, back home. How many? Just general percentage-wise. Oh, general percentage-wise. Serious? Well, when I look back, actually there were more women in, in uh -huh. German studies. Okay, They're yeah. usually, even the students, right. are more women. Okay than right. men. Yeah, so that is probably certainly true, but if you think back, maybe I'm a little older. But when I, when I go to the, for instance, when I do read the secondary literature, there are, mo there are mostly oh, men. Mostly That's men. true. I mean, most women were allowed into academia only in the 1960s or so. I mean, I got my PhD at the University of Virginia and in, in 1986, and women were allowed at that university only in 1960. I mean, as students. So the case is very clear. If you have only male scholars, male medievalists, male philologists, male scholars in general, why would they care about female issues? And so modern feminism, the entire scholarly approach to what was the history of women, women's writing, women's self-expression, is also closely connected with these texts. And I think they are really wonderful because they suddenly shatter that um, idea that women were always completely subjugated. To some extent, certainly true. Uh, we always have patriarchy, the church certainly holding very strong control over women, right? Uh, but if we look at these poems, they are troberitz. That's what we call troberitz. It's a little bit odd sounding word, but he, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you do have suddenly a large corpus or body of texts that were written by women. Still, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to identify precisely who these women were, but that's common for all medieval literature. We don't quite know because the biography has not handed down to us. The documents don't tell us that much. However, the selection we have here is firm. We know these, uh, these noble ladies. They are documented through other sources as well. And I think, and this is really where I need you, Martina, 
I think if we, in general, if we go through all those poems and think about their tone, their concerns, their troubles, their pride, their ideas, is there something, I mean, would you confirm or disagree with me that there is something typically feminine, female concerns? Yeah. Yeah? In what sense? Well, as being suppressed by society, there should be, only from yeah. the circumstance, looking on it, there should be a different perspective to than, that, yes, right? to express this and as well to express their, yeah, their role. Yeah, they reflect the subjugation, they reflect how hard it is for them, right, to, to come through. And so I think in these Trobaritz poems, we have an incredibly valuable document, literary documents that confirm how much that struggle for equality actually started much, much earlier. And sometimes that's the irony of history. History does not progress necessarily in a linear fashion. History does not move forward in a progressive fashion. So you could say in 1200 we had that condition, 1400 we had that, oh and then got better 1600 and then 1800 even better and today we're in the 21st century, so we're at the peak. I don't think it works that way. History goes up and down, and sometimes there are big struggles, and then people lose, other people win, so negotiations go back and forth, and so simply the assumption that because women in the 19th century, or let's say 18th century, were totally subjugated, doesn't necessarily mean that they were also equally, completely, and even worse subjugated in the Middle Ages than we would have thought, uh, assumed. So this documentation is really a remarkable, however, I also must say, a very unique phenomenon. But you know, the, the term Trubaritz, I mean here it says Troubadours, women Troubadours, I always refer to Troubaritz. It sounds harsh, Troubaritz. Uh, so, just simply by the sound of the name, Trobaritz, where are they located? Do you have an idea? More like Eastern? No, it's more Southern. It's Southern, southern France, it's the Provence, okay, and it is the world where they speak Occitan, which has a lot actually in common with Catalan. So, oh, okay. okay, so the Spanish-French world in Southern France merges and you have a, a new, an individual new form of language which is called Occitan. And so that's what they spoke, old medieval Occitan, for that reason the Troberitz. It's a little bit uh, unusual the sound. Okay, the very amazing feature here is that we do have these Troberitz. These are women who wrote in the early 12th century maybe up to 1260, 1280, but then they disappear. That's a very interesting thing. We do have a literary phenomenon, it's almost an enigma, almost a riddle. At some point, a certain group of people, namely women, were able to speak up, to formulate their thoughts about love, to partake in that general discussion about love, and what I find fascinating, they insist always on their own individuality, on their ability to speak their mind, to express themselves, to fight against wrongdoing. Uh, I think we will look at a couple of examples where, where these women then, my gosh, they, they accuse the men of saying, hey, infidelity, I don't like that, he ran away, or he abandon me. What a bastard! <laughs> but this is remarkable. It is remarkable for a number of reasons. One, these women were the first. We don't have any previous women, I mean secular women writers. We have lots of religious writers, women writers, monastic writers, women who lived in monasteries and wrote, already in the 10th century, actually even earlier. We do have those names and that makes good sense, they're part of the monastic culture. So Hildegard of Bingen is another famous example. Duoda is a 9th century Merovingian 
uh, writer. Uh, we have Roswit of Gandersheim, a 10th century writer. So a whole bunch of these monastic writers, wonderful. But in the secular world, in other words, in the world of the courts, we have a one-time phenomenon. In the early 12th century, these turbulets come forth, and then they disappear again. And then we look all over Europe, England, France, uh, Russia, Germany, Scandinavia, Italy, Spain. We don't have any other women. Nowhere, the entire medieval European landscape is empty, or as far at least as we can tell. I discovered a whole bunch of women writers in 15th and 16th centuries German songbooks at least where women speak up. Whether they actually were poems spoken by, uh, created by women, I do not know. Or often it's difficult to say no names. Um, very difficult. Sometimes religious poems, then it's clear there is a name. But the secular poems, erotic poems, very difficult to really say that, so we have to look very carefully at the content. Hence my question for you. Did you get the sense that there was um, an idea of feminine concerns. Maybe, because I was wondering if maybe some women were writing under a male, like under a man's name, to actually be able to get recognition. Exactly. That's one possibility. You, we never quite know this. So we have lots of names in these big collections, troubadour poems, hundreds and hundreds, and it could well be that a woman used a male pseudonym possible. But uh, we also have the other odd uh, phenomenon that a number of men used the female mask and they pretended to be a woman. Simply, I would say, for theatrical purposes. Oh, yeah. Just role, role playing. And this is not uncommon anyway. Women were not even allowed on stages until I think the 18th century or so. And so let's say if you think about Shakespeare, this Never mind whether you have female roles or male roles, they are men, yeah. male Still. actors, right? The more difficult question is, why do these women speak up? And I think if we turn uh, to the Countess of Dia, and uh, then later to some other of these writers like Asselé de Poiserage and so forth, we know about 15 names. They all live at about the same time. As I said, early 12th century, and that's precisely also the time when you have major development of the crusade. The first crusade takes place at the end of the 11th century. So 1096, they win Jerusalem, 1099. And um, from then on, you have one crusade after the other, 1204, for example. The crusaders don't even get to Jerusalem. They defeat Constantinople, for heaven's sake. Uh, it's a Christian city, but anyway. Um, but so you do have one crusade after the other. And what happens when you have a crusade? What happens with the men? I mean, whole thousands of nobles, they die. Or, let me be really nasty, they stay in Palestine, have a new girlfriend, and think, what the heck? Why should I care about my wife back home? So, we don't know. We don't know. But there's a number of, actually, uh, it is not so far-fetched. We have a number of chroniclers who write about the Crusader states, so what we call today Palestine and Israel, so early 12th century, and complain bitterly about the Christian knights who adapt to the Arabic culture, take baths, perfume, learn Arabic, have girlfriends. Oh my God, what happened there? So. This is a huge topic we don't quite know. But there's a lot of criticism against the Crusaders, the Knights. So anyway, in general, there are lots of possibilities. What could happen with the Crusaders? What do you think? What do you imagine? So they all go, march, or take a boat, a ship, to the Holy Land. And it's suddenly really hot. And they have to fight. What happens with many of these men? Well, first I would say they die. They die. They, they can drown. A famous German emperor drowned, actually. Uh, they can get malaria. They can die from their wounds, infection, bad hospitals, no good sanitation. 
or whatever. There are many, many possible reasons. Or the ship could go under, and you know, we had uh, Apollonia, so you know, the Eastern Mediterranean is not necessarily the safest sea. Anyway, so in the first half of the 12th century, you could almost say we have a huge loss of men. They just disappear, either permanently or just for a short time. We don't know. They might have returned. And uh, we believe that this provided a lot of these noble ladies with an opportunity. They ran their estates. Their husbands weren't there. Their brothers or their fathers weren't there. So they filled the void. And it's really quite fascinating because it's the only time when we do have this secular love poetry. You do not have secular love poetry of that sort in Germany. We do not have it in England. We do not have it in Spain. We do not have it in Scandinavia. Well, we do have some female poets in Scandinavia, but they normally write, I mean, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, and they write very aggressive military poems, more sort of in the heroic tradition, not the same as this. So it's a very unique phenomenon. And um, however we want to interpret these Trouberitz, um, I think what we need to do is kind of develop a thesis. There would be another great example. Maybe we could just uh, look at, um, let's say, uh, let's take a look at the very first poem by uh, T. Bors. I didn't mention her. And maybe we both could try to develop a thesis. So would you want to read it? The poem? Yeah, just read the poem quickly. OK. Sweet handsome friend, I can tell you truly that I've never been without desire since it pleased you that I've that I have you as my courtly lover, nor did a time ever arrive, sweet handsome friend, when I didn't want to see you often, nor did I ever feel regret, nor did I did it ever come to pass if you went off angry, that I felt joy until you had come back, nor And then it breaks off as a, as a it's fragment. Only fra yes. So it's a very short poem, and a woman speaks, we know for sure, and she emphasizes her desire, her love. Uh, there seem to have been tensions, uh, but she insists that she always wanted him to come back. And to see him. To see him. In other words, she insists on her right to have a lover to enjoy her love. This is a very fleeting, maybe ephemeral, development of poetic individuality. Ephemeral, so just passing, passing through the times, but it was there for a while. And she insists, and that's really so remarkable, that the female is given a chance to express that. After all, keep in mind, we talked about manuscripts. And we talked about how difficult it is to preserve any text from that time period. So only if you have a lot of money, if you have parchment, if you have a scribe, and if you have a whole team of people who support you in that process, can you make sure that your poetry survives. So these women are all noble ladies. They have money, they have status, they have a rec a reputation at her their time. And they use this as Tibors does to express her desire. So for me, a thesis would be just based on that um, a little poem here, the fragmented poem, as I just would formulate, um, as the poem by Tibors uh, indicates, Tobaret's poets were powerful, self-assured 12th century courtly ladies who knew how to formulate and defend their own emotions and gain thereby, that's then the conclusion of the thesis, gained cultural, social independence on the basis of their feelings of love. Do you think it's a thesis we could work with? Yeah, sure. If, yeah. It's, it's kind of challenging, right? It's a very structural. So, but now, you know, that's what you always have to do. Now you have to go back to the text. Now comes then the argument. Now you have to go back to the text, and then you have to say, as this line says, or as she, the poet, emphasizes, or in light of the words or phrases she uses, or with respect to the tension that she reflects, 
we can observe how much she insists on her own erotic individuality, and so forth and so forth, right? And so that's the argument, and then you would conclude, if you were writing just about this tiny little poem, indeed, the thesis holds because we have seen this and this, and then the paper works. Let's take a look at the Countess of Dia. And I think that's just, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Um, I thrive on youth and joy. Youth and joy keep me alive. So what I think is so important here, and by the way, I have the music, so we can play this afterwards. Um, what she is insisting so much, how important love can be to develop her own individuality. To, and I think this might be the hallmark of all of courtly love discourse. Whatever we will read, if you are a good lover, you gain honor. Love, however, under what circumstances, if you love honestly, purely, selflessly, faithfully, faithfully, exactly, that comes through all the time. The, uh, the Trubavits are angry at times, right? At, against, against these faithless men who have run away. Or they're angry at some of their fellow sisters uh, or sister poets who, in a way, sell their body. Uh, we have this in As Asilek de Poiserage, that's on page 163. I will turn to that, but if you, or maybe just do this quickly, and then I'll return to Comtesse de Dia. If you look at page 164, um, she says, for the people of Velay say love and money do not mix, and the women, woman money chooses, they say, has lost her honor. So let me ask you, how many famous women do you know who married a man because he had money? And how many men do you know who married a famous woman because she had money? So what are they saying? Um, they're saying honor and fidelity, loyalty. These are the values they want to emphasize. And if you look also in the second stanza of page 164, reciprocate. I reciprocate. So love, is love always a take? Is love always a give, or is love not more, give and take? Well, yeah, it's both at the same time. We had it with uh, Lord Henry. The girl wanted just to give completely, and that was not love. So only once Henry had learned that he had to give and to take was he able to get well again? Of course, in a spiritual level. The girl was completely wrong, off base, I would say, because she only wanted to give. She thought her well-being, her rescue, would rest in just giving herself. And just sacrifice is not love. You need to have something as well. You need to be an individual. So I think that's what comes through in these, these poems. These poems are great in this regard. Let's go back to uh, the very first one, as uh, Countess of Diem. Uh, we have to watch time a little bit. But um, I like folks on page 160. Okay. Why don't we take the third stanza? The Lady Who Knows? Yeah. Okay. Shall I read? Shall I read? Yeah. Okay. The lady who knows about Valor Vail mm -hmm. should place her affection in a courteous and worthy knight as soon as she has seen his worth and she should dare to love him face to face for courteous and worthy men can only speak with great esteem of a lady who loves openly loves openly no secrecy yeah and she says here and worthy men can only speak with great esteem of a lady who loves openly. yeah my gosh i find that i mean that's feminist that's very feminist. yeah 
It's wonderful. It's so refreshing. We don't need necessarily to have, let's say, 19th or 20th century feminists. We can start already here. And I think because we are in a very un, so, well, unexpected context, you know, we didn't expect to find these strong voices in the Middle Ages. Wow, that's great stuff. They say that love has something to do intimately with, uh, or intensively, with honor, with openness. You should not feel ashamed. You should not hide. You should be able to stand up for your love. And love leads to honor, uh, leads to courteousness, or we might say chivalry, worthiness, esteem, great lovers. And actually, this holds true throughout the centuries. If you think about world literature from day one of mankind until today, who are the most famous people? Lovers. Always. I mean, they might have failed. Think about uh, whatever. In Dante, you might think of Abelan Eloise, whose text we do have in this textbook as well. Uh, famous, famous lovers uh, who might have failed, but the reputation rests on them because if they die, um, you know, um, maybe uh, Shakespeare has many examples. The woman who then dies, or uh, the man who dies. Uh, maybe the most famous lovers uh, come to my mind. And all of you might know this too, that's in Shakespeare, but it actually goes back to Ovid, uh, Thermos, uh, Pyramus and Thisbe. These are the lovers, right, uh, who, who want to find their freedom and they escape from their parents' home. They want to meet out in the forest and shh, what is it? I think it's him. No, it's her who gets there first, but there's a lioness. So she gets scared, leaves her coat behind, and hides in a cave. And the lioness, who just had babies, sees the coat and tears it apart. But since the whole, her whole body is still bloody from the birth, the coat gets bloody. And then Pyramus arrives, sees only the coat, and commits suicide. <gasps> anyway, <laughs> we don't have suicide here. Thank God, no, this is all fine. These lovers are simply insisting that they should, can, want to achieve their love. And it should be open. And it should be just right. Uh, so she refers, for example, to at the end to a very famous literary figure, Floris. That's a figure from a romance we don't have anymore. But Floris, your worth is known to all good men. Therefore, I make this request. Please grant me your protection. So worthiness. Love translates into worthiness. Well, it makes the man worth, though, as well. Yeah, that's right. So these women are strong. That is a remarkable thing. A strong woman is a woman who can love. Weak women cannot love properly. That would be the argument here. So if you want to love, you have to follow, in a way, the argument uh, or the thesis developed by these women that um, true love requires a strong individual, a strong sense of self. Because what can you give? When you love and you don't have much, you're just very subservient, slave-type person, what can you give to your lover? What can you demand from him? You must demand something from your boyfriend, right? Or your husband. That he does something for you, right? Yeah. Right? So I think, once again, these women speak to our heart in one way because they suddenly bring out uh, aspects of true love that we might have forgotten or have not quite enough paid attention enough to. And now suddenly we're confronted with them because these women, in a very unusual context, are able to speak up and fight for love that is open, loyal, and leads to honor. Um, and if you look at the second poem, I think there she is suddenly much more negative because uh, 
Am I seeing so bitter? Do I feel toward him? So that could be the other side. She loves him more than anything, she says. You know, page 161 on the top. Okay? Please follow me there. With him, my mercy and fine manners are in vain. Ooh, interesting. So she puts herself on top of him. She has better manners. She has more mercy, meaning virtues. My beauty, virtue, and intelligent. intelligence. For I have been tricked and cheated, as if I were completely loathsome. Strong words. Do you think a modern woman could say that? Or would say that? If you had no idea about these poems, you just came across, across these lines. It's almost postmodern. Yeah, sure. Totally. Totally, right? I mean, it's, the experiences, yeah. I would say they stay the same. Yeah. So, yeah, sure, of course. And look at the next uh, stanza. Um, I love it, what she says. I have never wronged. I've never wronged. My love is honest. My love is true. And I love you more than, so she refers to another literary figure, uh, Seguin Lord Valenza. At least in love I have my victory, since I surpass the worthiest of men. Wow. That's radical. Yeah. Very interesting what we have. Um, we will not spend too much time. I think it's almost uh, uh, at the end of our time. I think uh, it becomes a little bit uh, um, exhausting for everyone um, because it is uh, online here and through a video. But I think we can leave uh, more or less our discussion with this uh, passage or maybe one more, maybe the end stanza. My worth and noble birth should have some weight. So she doesn't simply say, I am of a higher rank. She says, my, my worth, my individual value, my beauty, and especially my noble thoughts. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, she's referring to herself as being intelligent and yeah. This is what she wants him to recognize. And that she has nobility. Not necessarily social nobility. She means nobility of her. Yeah. Wow. That's what love does. It forces you to be a noble person. To be the best person you can be. And these women insist. I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, you can apply this to men as well. I mean, men say that a lot. And I think we have seen it with Lord Henry as well. Uh, we have seen it with some of the Troubadour poems uh, on Tuesday. But here it comes from a woman's mouth. And she insists. It is my inner character, character that makes it possible to develop love. If you don't have that character, you won't have that love. Right? That's what I've often said. Do not cheat. Do not plagiarize. Otherwise, your character suffers. And then you won't love. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I think that should be enough. I think you got the general uh, gist of it. We have many more poems. Uh, we maybe can play afterwards two or three songs mm -hmm. so that you get at least a little bit of a sense of how this music was presented in a musical form as a performance. Okay, Martina, thank you very much. It was great having you. And uh, I see you all then on, uh, well, next Tuesday in class. Thank you very much.